Welcome to Worship at St. Peter's Evangelical Lutheran Church in Winnipeg. Willkommen zum Gottesdienst in der evangelisch-lutherischen St. Petri Gemeinde in Winnipeg. I would like to invite you as part of our announcements to um, come to our communion appointments. You would need to schedule an appointment for uh, Wednesday mornings between 10 and 12 noon and then in the evening at 6.30 to 7.30. And um, in order to schedule your appointment, please contact the uh, church office, call the church office and the information how you can reach our church office is on the slide. Let us prepare for worship for this uh, Sunday of Transfiguration. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. It connects us to Jesus' baptism next to his miracles through which people could catch a glimpse of Jesus as the Messiah. The claim that Jesus was the Son of God was confirmed twice through the voice that came from heaven at Jesus' baptism and on the mountain of the Transfiguration. In great detail, the evangelists have recorded these occurrences to strengthen our faith. Wir begehen heute das Fest der Verklärung des Herrn. Es knüpft an die Taufe Jesu an. Neben seinen Wundern, infolge derer die Menschen bereits auf Jesu mögliche Messianität schließen konnten, bestätigt ihn nach den Berichten der Bibel zweimal eine Stimme als den Sohn Gottes nach der Taufe am Jordan und auf dem Berg der Verklärung. Die Evangelisten überliefern beide Ereignisse sehr umfassend, um den Glauben der Christen zu festigen und zu stärken. Zum Eingang singen wir das Lied Morgenglanz der Ewigkeit. Our opening hymn is Come, thou bright and morning star. We have gathered for worship on Transfiguration Sunday. In the name of God the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Wir sind zusammengekommen am Verklärungssonntag zum Gottesdienst im Namen Gottes des Vaters und des Heiligen Geistes. Amen. Let us confess our sins before God. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son, Jesus, to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a call and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of God the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 50, verses 1 through 6. The Lord, the God of gods, has spoken. He has called the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God reveals himself in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence. Before him there is a consuming flame, and round about him a raging storm. He calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of his people. Gather before me, my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. Let the heavens declare the rightness of his cause for God himself is judge. Let us pray. God of majesty, through Jesus' transfiguration, you reveal him as your beloved son. Keep us faithful in the promise that through the cross and the empty tomb, we are joined heirs with Christ and will one day enjoy the fullness of your glory for eternity. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Wir beten. Allmächtiger Gott, bei der Verklärung deines eingeborenen Sohnes hast du durch das Zeugnis der Väter die Geheimnisse unseres Glaubens bekräftigt. Hilf uns, auf das Wort deines Sohnes zu hören, damit wir Anteil erhalten an seiner Herrlichkeit. Darum bitten wir durch Jesus Christus. Amen. We now hear the gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, It is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. 
And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And they asked them, What are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And then the spirit saw him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. The Gospel of the Lord. Das Evangelium befindet sich in Markus im Kapitel 9. Und nach sechs Tagen nahm Jesus mit sich Petrus, Jakobus und Johannes und führte sie auf einen hohen Berg, nur sie allein. Und er wurde vor ihnen verklärt, und seine Kleider wurden hell und sehr weiß, wie sie kein Bleicher auf Erden so weiß machen kann. Und es erschien ihnen Elia mit Mose, und sie redeten mit Jesus. Und Petrus antwortete und sprach zu Jesus, Rabbi, hier ist für uns gut sein. Wir wollen drei Hütten bauen, dir eine, Mose eine und Elia eine. Er wusste aber nicht, was er redete denn sie waren verstört. Und es kam eine Wolke, über die, überschatte, die überschattete sie. Und eine Stimme geschah aus der Wolke. Das ist mein lieber Sohn, den sollt ihr hören. Und auf einmal, als sie um sich blickten, sahen sie niemand mehr bei sich als Jesus allein. Als sie aber vom Berg herabgingen, gebot ihnen Jesus, dass sie niemanden sagen sollten, was sie gesehen hatten bis der Menschensohn auferstanden von den Toten. Und sie kamen zu den Jüngern und sahen eine große Menge um sie herum und Schriftgelehrte, die mit ihnen stritten. Und sobald die Menge ihn sah, entsetzten, sie, entsetzten sich alle, liefen herbei und grüßten ihn. Und er fragte sie, was streitet ihr mit ihnen? Einer aber aus der Menge antwortete, Meister, ich habe meinen Sohn hergebracht zu dir. Der hat einen sprachlosen Geist, und wo er ihn erwischt, reißt er ihn zu Boden. Und er hat Schaum vor dem Mund und knirscht mit den Zähnen und wird starr. Und ich habe mit deinen Jüngern geredet, dass sie ihnen austreiben sollen, und sie konnten es nicht. Er antwortet ihnen aber und sprach, O du ungläubiges Geschlecht, wie lange soll ich bei euch sein, wie lange soll ich euch ertragen? Bringt ihn her zu mir. Und sie brachten ihn zu ihm. Und sogleich, als ihn der Geist sah, riss er ihn hin und her. Und er fiel auf die Erde, wälzte sich und hatte Schaum vor dem Mund. Und Jesus fragte seinen Vater, wie lange ist, dass ihm das widerfährt? 
Er sprach von Kind auf. Und oft hat er ihn ins Feuer und ins Wasser geworfen, dass er ihn umbrächte. Wenn du aber etwas kannst, so erbarme dich unser und hilf uns. Jesus aber sprach zu ihm, du sagst, wenn du kannst, alle Dinge sind möglich dem, der da glaubt. Sogleich schrie der Vater des Kindes, ich glaube, hilf meinen Unglauben. Als nun Jesus sah, dass die Menge zusammenlief, bedrohte er den unreinen Geist und sprach zu ihm, du sprachloser und tauber Geist, ich gebiete dir, fahre von ihm aus und fahre nicht mehr in ihn hinein. Da schrie er und riss ihn heftig hin und her und fuhr aus. Und er lag da wie tot, so dass alle sagten, er ist tot. Jesus aber ergriff seine Hand und richtete ihn auf, und er stand auf. Und als er ins Haus kam, fragten ihn seine Jünger für sich allein, warum konnten wir ihn, ihn nicht austreiben? Und er sprach, diese Art kann durch nichts ausfahren als durch Beten. Das Evangelium. Let us now sing our next hymn, Love Divine or Love Excelling.
Im Namen Gottes des Vaters und des Sohnes und des Heiligen Geistes, in the name of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, liebe Brüder und Schwestern in unserem Herrn Jesus Christus, am heutigen Verklärungssonntag fällt unser Blick auf, die Glücks, auf das Glücksmoment der Herrlichkeit, das Jesus und drei seiner Jünger oben auf dem Berg der Verklärung erlebten, als sich Jesu äußerliche Gestalt, umgeben vom Gesetzgeber Moses und dem Propheten Elia, auf wundersame Weise veränderte und in einem neuen, hellen Licht erstrahlen ließ. Petrus, auch wenn er nicht wusste, was ihm geschah, wie ihm geschah, erkannte, dass dies ein besonderer Moment war. Er wollte nicht mehr von dort oben weg. Rabbi, sagte er zu Jesus, lass uns hier bleiben, denn hier ist es schön. Auch, wenn wir, auch wir sind dazu geneigt, die Gegensätze oben, unten, mit Glücksgefühlen bzw. Niedergeschlagenheit gleichzusetzen. Oben auf dem Berg ist alles gut, unten im Tal dagegen schlecht. Wir wissen, dass diese Beschreibung zu einfach ist. Doch hat sie sich als solche durchaus eingebürgert. Uns ist bewusst, dass die Zusammenhänge viel komplexer sind. Denn nicht alles, was oben auf dem Berg geschieht, auch wenn die Aussicht spektakulär ist, ist gut. Nicht alles, was wir im Tal vorfinden, ist schlecht, denn auch dort gibt es wunderbare Plätze. Auch Jesus wusste, dass er nicht nur oben auf dem Berg verweilen sollte, sondern dass er auch unten im Tal gebraucht wurde. Das zeigt die folgende Erzählung, die ich mit in die Lesung aufgenommen habe. Sie kommt im Lektionar sonst nicht vor, das heißt, wir kriegen sie im Gottesdienst für gewöhnlich nicht zu hören. Ich denke aber, dass sie wichtig ist, für unseren Zusammenhang. In dieser Erzählung hören wir also von der Heilung eines Jungen, der von einem Geist, von einem Geist, der ihn stumm gemacht hat, von einem unreinen Geist besessen war, der ihn in Anfällen, die an Epilepsie erinnern, hin und her riss. Dieser Junge litt unter einer mentalen Krankheit und die Jünger waren nicht in der Lage, ihn zu heilen. Diese Begebenheit zeigt auch unsere anhaltenden Schwierigkeiten und Probleme, die wir haben im Umgang mit Menschen, die unter mentalen Krankheiten leiden. Auch wenn es Millionen von solchen Patienten um uns herum gibt und vielleicht sind wir ja auch selbst davon betroffen, führen sie immer noch ein Schattendasein. Die werden nicht richtig wahrgenommen, sowohl in der Gesellschaft als auch in der Kirche. Grund genug also der Sache nachzugehen, wie die Herrlichkeit Gottes, die mit Jesus in der Welt erstrahlte, auch den Menschen gilt, die sich in einer dunklen mentalen Verfassung und Umgebung befinden, wie Jesus auch sie mit seiner Gegenwart erfüllt. Mit der Verklärungserzählung erfahren wir damit eine Verwandlung, die Leiden und Dunkelheit ernst nimmt. Wir erkennen, dass Jesus in die Welt gekommen ist, um nicht nur oben auf dem Berg zu bleiben, sondern auch, um selbst die dunkelsten Täler in der Welt mit seiner Gegenwart zu erhellen. Transfiguration Sunday describes a mountaintop experience. When we look at the following pair of opposites, high and low, we often tend to associate high with something good, as in my mood is up, and low with something not so good, bad, as in My mood is down. Hence, we assume that the top of a mountain represents something wonderful, beautiful, uplifting, just as Peter alluded to it when he exclaimed, Rabbi, it is good to be up here. On the other hand, the things that are happening down there in the valley are unappealing, dire as in, and though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Up, down, up is good. Down is bad, up is exciting, down is so downtrodden. We know this view is too simplistic. This pair of opposites does not represent the full spectrum of emotions, moods, or various facets of our life. As if we were dealing with just an either-or approach, when in reality it is more of an as-well-as experience. For dangerous things can await you on the mountaintop as well. In the valley you can find some beautiful meadows that are blossoming. Most of the things in life that we experience tangle somewhere between 
these two extremes of high and low. Jesus seemed to understand that there is more to these basic experiences. He knew that there is more to life than wanting to stay on the top of a mountain. He knew that he was also needed in the valley below. On Transfiguration Sunday, we focus on what happened up there on that mountain, but we usually don't hear how the story continues. For the rest of the chapter is omitted from the lectionary. We usually do not hear about the healing of the boy who was plagued, tormented by an evil spirit, an evil a spirit that rendered him mute. It sounds as though he was suffering from what we commonly describe as epilepsy. This passage is omitted from the lectionary. This means we do not get to hear it in worship. But I think that it offers us some important glimpses into how Jesus and understood, saw and understood his ministry. That's why I chose to include the reading of this story as a part of our gospel lesson this morning. It tells us that Jesus' stay on the mountain of the transfiguration is an in-between space in Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. It is a prologue to Jesus' passion and death on another mountain, Golgotha just outside of Jerusalem. I think that the story about the boy who was tossed about, shaken around and afflicted by epileptic seizures, gives us an opportunity to talk about an often neglected topic in our society and even within our churches. It also shows in how we are dealing with or fail to support people with mental disabilities. Just a few days ago, we learned of another example in the United States of undue police force when a nine-year-old girl with an apparent mental disability was mistreated, pepper sprayed, and handcuffed. She is one out of millions of people who suffer from depression or other expressions of mental illness. And you don't have to suffer from clinical depression. It is, so, it is no secret that all of us at times experience the low side of life. Life does not only consist of highs. Let's put that in perspective of our gospel text. Again, Jesus knew that unlike Peter's good and well-meaning intentions, he could not stay up there on the mountain. He was also needed in the valley. When Jesus came down from the mountain, he ran into the problems of real life again. When Jesus healed the boy, the disciples, the parents, the bystanders, they all could discover that God is not only found on the top of a mountain, but that he also dwells in the valley. Down in the valley, Jesus was able to help this boy and many others who were also suffering from all kinds of illnesses and ailments. But what stands out in this context is that Jesus, in the words of Paul Claudel, did not come to remove suffering or to explain it away. No, there is more to it. Jesus came to fill it with his presence. Jesus came to fill it, the suffering, with his presence. He came to fill those who suffered with his presence. He came to fill a suffering world with his presence. We all know that the world can be a truly dark and scary place. There are those who are suffering physically and emotionally. There are numerous other forms of suffering. An economic downturn can make us suffer financially. When nature suffers from pollution, there is this groaning of creation. For months now we are affected by this pandemic and there is still no real end in sight. Once our eyes and hearts and overall perception have become accustomed to the darkness around us, we might become oblivious to the still ongoing radiance and warmth of the light which could shine the prospects of hope into our soul, into our very selves. Our faith tells us that Jesus does not only bring the light into the dark world, he himself is the light which dispels the darkness of pain, suffering, and death. No matter how dark, no matter how bleak, no matter how severe the suffering 
our faith in Christ tells us that God is always present in all of our circumstances, not just the good ones. The boy in the text had to live with the darkness of epilepsy. People are afflicted by and live with all kinds of illnesses. Episcopal priest Catherine Green McCrate has written a thought-provoking book on mental illness. I think it is worth hearing her own struggles with and opinions on this topic in her own voice. That's why I opted to quote from her book, Darkness is My Only Companion, a Christian response to mental illness, more extensively than I usually would do. In this book, she described that the mentally ill are one of the groups of handicapped people against whom it still seems to be socially acceptable to hold prejudice. She observed this seems to be as true in the secular world as it is within Christian communities. For people do not understand mental illness in part, there is a false assumption that the Christian, that the Christian life should always be an easy path. And in part, the problem of suffering is hard to grasp. While the concept of suffering is hard to grasp, Green McCright asserts for the Christian who believes in the crucified and risen Messiah, suffering is always meaningful. It is meaningful because of the one in whose suffering we participate, Jesus. This is neither to say, of course, as Green McCride puts it so wonderfully, that suffering will be pleasant, nor is it to be sought. Rather, the personal suffering of the Christian finds a correlate in Christ's suffering, which gathers up our tears, calms our sorrows, and points us toward his resurrection. And this is what the transfiguration is all about. In theological terms, the author describes her own struggles and experiences with depression, the darkness of mental illness. She makes an appeal to the church and to the people in the church to care for her ill. If not, we would be like Jesus' disciples, unable to confront or even cast out the demons in our midst. Green McCright learned that sick people are not necessarily weak. Sick people are just afflicted, and they need the help of the Christian community. The mentally ill can shock people, and the stigma of mental illness can mean that people are often turned off to the sufferer. But it should be the Christian community of all places where such sufferers are welcomed and supported, prayed for and comforted. And if you ask me, why it is so important to pray for those who are afflicted by mental illness, because they themselves have often a very difficult time praying. Our author dated her book on the feast day of the Transfiguration. It was published in 2005. As if she wanted to say, as we ponder the story of Jesus' Transfiguration, there is hope in despair. There shines a light of Christ into the darkness. I think it is this significant that when we live in darkness, we should not console ourselves by saying that there will be light at the end of the tunnel. Rather, and I'm sure you have heard me say something like that before, I like to modify the idiom so that it now says that I want the light to find me. I want the light to come to me in the darkness of the tunnel. If you ask me, I find this view more comforting. In the Gospel text, we heard that Jesus rebuked Peter because he wanted to stay, he, Peter, wanted to stay on the mountaintop. We could read into Peter's response that after this moment of joyful exuberance, he was just afraid to return to the dark places in the valley. Now, by going back into the valley, Jesus challenged his disciples then and he challenges us today to bring that light of Christ into the dark tunnels, to become beacons of his light to those who are stuck in the dark tunnels of mental illness or other troubling 
conditions. Truly, this is truly a transfiguration, one that leads to a light-filled transformation of the body of Christ, a transformation which does not take, talk away suffering and darkness, but rather takes them seriously. Because we know that Christ came to fill this place, to fill this world, the valleys in this world, with his presence. Amen. Und der Friede Gottes, welcher höher ist als alle menschliche Vernunft, bewahre eure Herzen und Sinne in Christus Jesus, unserem Herrn. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Next, let us sing. Jesus has come and brings pleasure eternal. Unser nächstes Lied ist Jesus ist kommen und ewiger Freude. Standing in trust and hope, let us confess, let us profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. When Jesus went with three of his disciples on the mountain of the Transfiguration, Peter got excited. He exclaimed, That's amazing, Jesus. This is great. Let's stay here forever. 
Peter experienced something great, a moment of glory. So can we blame him for how he responded? Can we blame him for his excitement? I think we can share his excitement, we can share his sentiments. When we love a vacation spot, don't we want to stay there forever? When we won an important competition, don't we want that moment to last forever? When we received an award for a job well done, don't we want to maintain that feeling of achievement forever? When we have found the most wonderful person, don't we want to live with her or with him forever? But then, when we wake up from the moment of bliss, reality kicks back in. And reality can be very brutal. After the dream vacation, I find myself back in a boring office. After my surprise victory, I lose the next time against a no-name wildcard participant in the first round. After the praise on the job, I don't seem to get my focus right. After spending time with Mrs. Wonderful, I realize that we are meant to spend not only the good, but also the bad times. We all know whether it is on the mountaintop or in the valley, life can be rewarding or challenging in either place. Peter makes a mistake by basing his good fortune on a location. This seems to be a bit of a narrow focus. We are not only up there on the mountain or down there in the valley. Likewise, Jesus asks us to go to, to, go to places in order to do our ministry, no matter where we are, to the best of our ability, we shall strive to function as good and faithful servants. I think Peter misses an important point here. It is not about the location, it is about the person. He should have based his reaction on who Jesus is. Jesus, now we see more clearly now I see more clearly that you are truly the Son of God, the Son of the living God. It is good to know that you walk with us and I want to walk with you. Let us walk with you forever. And may along the way, and may you grant us the gift that we need to serve our neighbors in your name. I want to thank you for your ministry and for your support as a result of your encounter and your walk with Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, with many resources you have blessed us, and we pray that you teach our hearts to know contentment and peace in all the blessings you have supplied. Make us generous that what we have received we may share with those in need and give to your church in service with grateful hearts and a confident faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you revealed your glory in the transfiguration of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Open our eyes of faith that we would see him continuing to dwell among us in our divine service, and that we would heed your admonition to listen to him as he forgives and preserves us at the font, pulpit, and altar. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy Father, with the appearance of Moses and Elijah at our Lord's glorious transfiguration, you reveal to us that all the law and the prophets are fulfilled in him. Send your blessing upon all pastors and servants of your church, that all their preaching and teaching would flow from the right understanding that all Holy Scripture testifies of Christ and all that he has done and continues to do for our eternal salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty Father, you alone establish all authority on earth. Bless those entrusted with this responsibility, both here and abroad, that they would serve with integrity and honor and for the well-being of all. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful Father, graciously comfort and strengthen those who are sick, hospitalized, or enduring ongoing treatment, that they would know your peace and receive healing and relief according to your gracious will. 
Be with those who are lonely, depressed, or mentally ill. Surround them with those who know your redeeming love and will mercifully care for them. Grant, st grant steadfastness to those near death, comfort to those who grieve, and the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to all your children. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Für alle Menschen, die sich in auswegslosen Situationen befinden und keine Perspektive in ihrem Leben sehen, wir bitten dich. Christus, erhöre uns. Für alle, die sich als Christinnen und Christen in der Nachfolge Jesu, in der Nachfolge Jesu bemühen, ihm immer ähnlicher zu werden, wir bitten dich. Christus, erhöre uns. Für alle, die aufgrund der Corona-Krise gesundheitlich, finanzielle oder psychische Probleme haben, wir bitten dich. Christus, erhöre uns. Für unsere Verstorbenen, auf dass sie nach der Vollendung ihres Lebensweges hier Gemeinschaft haben mit dir im Himmelreich, wir bitten dich. Christus, erhöre uns. Gott, du hast uns in Jesus ein Vorbild für unser Leben geschenkt. Dafür loben wir dich und danken dir heute und alle Tage unseres Lebens. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him, Jesus Christ our Lord, who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We now pray with the words that our Lord Jesus has taught us to pray. Gemeinsam wollen wir das Vater unser beten. Vater unser im Himmel, geheiligt werde dein Name, dein Reich komme, dein Wille geschehe wie im Himmel so auf Erden. Unser tägliches Brot gib uns heute und vergib uns unsere Schuld, wie auch wir vergeben unseren Schuldigern. Und führe uns nicht in Versuchung, sondern erlöse uns von dem Bösen. Denn dein ist das Reich und die Kraft und die Herrlichkeit in Ewigkeit. Amen. Dear worshipers and dear members of St. Peter's, I want to invite you to participate from your homes in this Lenten project on the Arma Christi. This is Latin for the arms, weapons of Christ. These are not weapons, though, with which Jesus engaged in battle. These are weapons, instruments, objects that had become a part of his passion story, contributing to Jesus' suffering and death. Maybe you haven't heard of the Amar Christi before, and yet maybe without realizing it, you have been exposed to the Arma Christi in our church all along. When coming to worship at St. Peter's during Lent, you can see this banner hanging from the wall. And this is an example of the Arma Christi. Each week during Lent, we will be adding another object. You will be notified about it, and this object will be explained to you. With that, I want to invite you to build a little Arma Christi table, Arma Christi display at your home. You can create your own Lenten display. And I welcome your photos. Send them to me. And with your permission, we can show these examples of your displays in some slides during our worship services. And this way, we are participating in each other's efforts in our journey we are connected through the same project, even though we are not in the same place for worship. Well, at least for the time being. One word of admonition. The project, the display is meant to be meditative, to have a visual and tangible connection to Jesus going through his trials. So please, when you send your photos, this is not a competition as to who will produce the most beautiful Lenten display. Rather, keep this display of the objects simple, the way it appeals to you. And thank you for your participation. This takes us to our first object.
This takes us to the burial of the Alleluia. In ancient times, it was tradition of the church to bury the word Alleluia in a symbolic ritual. Because during the season of Lent, we are asked to refrain from saying the word Alleluia, praise the Lord. And so this is what we are going to do now. On these sheets, in German and in English, I wrote the word Alleluia, Hallelujah. I will fold them together. and bury them in this tomb-like jar. And the word Alleluia will remain in here until Easter Sunday, when the tomb will be open again, when the word Alleluia can be said again, can be sung again, will be resurrected. And if you wish for your own Lenten display, this might be your first object to put on your table. Since the word Alleluia will be silent for quite some time now, for the next six plus weeks, let us sing and use the word Alleluia often with a hymn, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, suche zuerst das Reich Gottes in dieser Welt. Lasst uns gehen mit dem Segen des Herrn. Der Herr segne euch und behüte euch, der Herr. Lasst sein Angesicht leuchten über euch und sei euch gnädig. Der Herr erhebe sein Angesicht auf euch und gebe euch seinen Frieden. Let us go with the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Geht hin im Frieden des Herrn. Gott sei ewiglich Dank. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.